Okay, uh, so this is, this is week, week two, and we're building up to really try and get a solid foundation. So we'll probably take a few more principles before we really settle down where we are. Certainly, when we do hashing uh, next week, it should start to come together uh, about, uh, about the robustness. We might think we have 256-bit AES and it'll take a zillion years to crack, but we're using QWERTY123 to generate uh, the key. So tools like Hashcat uh, know that. The days of rainbow tables are really gone. Uh, the days of brute force and of targeted, uh, as we saw last week, most of us have an uppercase letter and one. Most of us put the, the number at the end. When we look at Hashcat, we'll see that we can set up rules uh, to be able to understand that. So it doesn't do any good to have amazing crypto where you've actually put a, a very simple password on your, your private key for your whole, your whole company. Okay, so in this lecture, we'll look at probably the foundation layer, and that's symmetric key. <laughs> Is it possible for Bob and Alice to have the same key? And then they just lock, just like we use the same key for a door, uh, they share the same key, and if they need a new key, they just generate a new one. So obviously the problem that we have is how we generate that key, because Eve could be listening. So later on in the module, we'll do key exchange. Is it possible for Bob and Alice to communicate openly and for no one uh, to discover the, the key that they've used? Did anybody see anything in the news this week, a kind of crypto-related thing? I'll give you a clue. This device is manufactured by that company. Did anybody see a significant news item? It's got an iPhone here, but a third of you or so. Anybody see the, the Apple headline? Something about Apple refusing to, was it um, something to do with cloud encryption? Yeah, so the backup to the iCloud for your messages and so on, they wanted uh, to encrypt that, but I think they've pulled... Wasn't it the FBI wanted them to do it? FBI uh, uh, allegedly <laughs> wanted them to do it, okay? So don't, it's like... Uh, keys under the mat, okay? You know, have you ever done that? Like if you put the keys under the mat for somebody's house or the flower pot and so on. If you have keys, don't put them under the mat and with a big message saying the keys under the mat, okay, for any intruder. Okay, so we'll try and do some, some basics uh, today. Uh, we'll look at the difference between uh, a block cipher and a stream cipher. Later on in the module, we'll find out that IoT lightweight sensors and so on cannot cope with the crypto that we would normally use for our, our desktops. Public key encryption, even AES, you will struggle to get that on a device. So increasingly, and I bet you, you're actually using ChaCha20 when you connect to Google. Uh, we'll see a bit later on, but uh, AES isn't the only show in town. Uh, we now use uh, stream uh, methods uh, increasingly. Then we'll look at the basic methods and then this will come back again and again when we look at uh, hashing and other things, the usage of salt. What we need to make sure is that every single time that we cipher, we add some salt to what it is we're doing and then uh, our output ciphers will change. So the king of the hill is AES, uh, uh, used to be called Rindal, the Rindal method after its, after its creator. And uh, it's still the most robust encryption method, symmetric key encryption method uh, around. And then in places, a method called 3DES is used. It's an interesting one because it shows an old method of DES and then how it's been upgraded with its security uh, to make it three days. <laughs> and we'll see how that was created. 
And then finally, we'll look at uh, Cha Cha 20, uh, which is really taking off uh, massively, and RC4, which are stream uh, ciphers. And then finally, you probably won't get it straight away, but we'll look at what's called key entropy. <laughs> uh, if the concept even sounds difficult itself, but it's not that difficult, I can assure you. But it's a really important concept. It's really trying to understand uh, the strength of the crypto that you have. As I said, you might have a 256-bit AES key that will take a zillion, zillion years to decrypt, uh, but you're only using a simple pass, password to generate the key. Because most of us can't remember keys, we need to remember passphrases. So our keys are generated through what's called a key derivation function. And that key derivation function will take a password and generate a key for us. Uh, if we use weak passwords or passphrases, it's not too difficult for somebody to use Hashcat or a bit of Python code to go through lots of different uh, words. I mean, looking at 10 gigahashes, 100 gigahashes uh, per second, <laughs> doesn't take them that long to crack a digital certificate with a simple password and so on. Uh, there was a good example of uh, the Lenovo hack. Don't know if anybody heard of the Lenovo hack, uh, but there was a bit of uh, uh, spyware on it. It broke the Google. When you searched Google, it went to some other place and modified the search that, that came back. Unfortunately, the developer put the public and the private key of a certificate as a distribution onto the host. And it took how long to crack the certificate? One minute. And it was the name of the company who had actually developed the backdoor software. So just watch, you think you're using the best in practice, but you're actually giving uh, it, it away to, to others. Okay, so here's Bob. Okay, Bob, and there's Alice. Okay, so our challenge really is to make sure that uh, when Bob and Alice communicate, that we have CIA. C for confidentiality and availability. I always get the last one wrong. Do you know that? But that's the most important one. You, you do know that. <laughs> if you have no availability, you have none of the other ones. Okay. A, A, A. Can you remember that, that one? Anybody remember that one? Authentication. Access. Third. I can't remember either. <laughs> it's a Cisco, Cisco one. Uh, look up. What is it? The auditing, yeah. Auditing, so important, so important. Don't just audit for good things, audit for bad things too. Bad logins, good logins. Audit both of them, they're really important. Okay, so we need confidentiality between uh, Bob and Alice, which means that only they should be able to uh, read uh, the message. We've got integrity, and when we look at hashing, integrity will come into our hashing method, uh, and uh, authentication will come into our usage of public key encryption. But just now, we just want to keep something uh, secret. So Bob needs to communicate with Alice, and what we use is a well-known uh, method that everybody knows about. They can get the source code, nothing secret in it at all. What we get is that we want to create a method where there are just too many keys for Eve to check. Basically, it comes down to a dollar value on, on searching for the keys. Uh, so she can rent a GPU cluster on Amazon for say $10 an hour. And now she can go through billions of keys every second. Okay, multiply that up, that gives you minutes and then hours. She's gonna be able to search a lot 
of, of keys. So if we make this too small, then let's say a 64-bit key, then it's possible even on your own desktop without a GPU to actually search through every single key and eventually find it. So equivalent to taking your keys, trying the door, and then one will eventually work. The bigger the bunch of keys that you have, the longer it's going to take you to find the, the, right, the right key. So our challenge is to make sure that that is too expensive. It's going to cost her too much money. Basically, it comes down to energy. It's, someone has to pay the electricity bill to keep the GPU running. Every little clock cycle consumes electricity that you have to pay for. So that's the cost, really. There's the cost of the hardware, of course, but mainly it's the cost of the thing actually running. If you've ever run a GPU, you'll know that it's a hungry beast. It needs lots of electricity. I'll show a farm, a GPU server farm a little bit later uh, and uh, to see how that works. Okay, so we need to make sure that we have lots and lots of keys that uh, Eve has to find. But Alice can do it in an instance. So it has to be efficient. It has to be secure, of course, and it has to be uh, efficient. There was a paper published last week called Too Much Crypto. It's a great paper. I'll, I'll send it on the Slack channel. Too Much Crypto. When we've been assessing all those crypto methods, Security has always been the number one. It's got to be secure. Space aliens shouldn't even be able to crack this. And you go, why? <laughs> What's the problem? Why are you not looking at performance and battery drain and, and other things? So there is a viewpoint that, that maybe, and I'll show you the method, we're a bit too much of a stickler for security. If it's already crazy, it will cost trillions of dollars even for the NSA to crack a single key, then why do we have to keep assessing security up to that? Can we not reduce it? And then we could actually bring in performance, make it quicker, make it more efficient, uh, and so on. So there is a balance, and when NIST uh, uh, assessed AES, there was a scorecard that included security, performance, AES didn't win on, uh, on energy efficiency, it won on security. And there are actually now better methods that could be used that don't have the security level of AES, but are great for performance for things like uh, IoT. So later on the module, we'll do a little bit on uh, lightweight uh, crypto and some of the methods that are used there. So what we have really is that we need a key exchange method Typically, that's what's called a Diffie-Hellman and an extension to that. Uh, they openly communicate, and in the end, they have the same shared key. Okay? That key either exists for a long time or a very short time. In the perfect case, it exists once, and it's gone. It's never going to happen ever again at any single time in the future. There are that many keys involved. Uh, for Bitcoin, nobody's ever going to have the same private key, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I'll show you a bit later on in the module, but some people do have the same key. There's flaws in software. Uh, the key, a private key of one, <laughs> exists I think at least about a thousand times. Uh, there's some flaw in, in, in the software, but really your key should never uh, exist. Uh, later on, we'll look at at uh, how it's possible uh, to make sure that none of your keys that you've used in the past will be uh, cracked. Okay, when we look at TLS, we'll see there is a method now, and TLS 1.3 supports this, to make sure if somebody gets your long-term key, they cannot look at all your Wireshark and crack all of your keys that you've used uh, in, in, in the past. Okay, but for just now, we're going to look at, uh, at uh, symmetric key encryption. Okay, so there's, we did that one. That was just a little introduction for you. We won't assess anything in there. 
And now we're starting on our first uh, real uh, 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 unit uh, now. Okay, so you should find on the GitHub, uh, we've got the content, so today's lecture should be there uh, eventually. Uh, the labs, uh, the lab for today is uh, looking at uh, symmetric key encryption. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of the content again, just so that you can get used to it. Okay, so this should come off Moodle and you'll just go to Unit 2. And Unit 2, you've got today's lecture. Uh, the lab content should be in there. Uh, try not to look, but there's some sample answers there. <laughs> okay, so only when you're really struggling do you actually go a little bit in here and actually have a look uh, to see that. If I've missed any out, then, then uh, uh, give us a shout. Uh, so most of the content should be uh, in there uh, and the key learning objectives that we have for, for each unit. I've included sample exam questions. Don't worry too much just now about them. Uh, I'll give you a heads up on how you might want to write towards that. But our first test will be all about writing against these type of uh, questions. No multiple choice at all. Uh, they are written more in a critique type way. <laughs> Bob the investigator has lost his private key <laughs> and somebody's found it. What problems might that bring? Okay, so try to get yourself into that mode of an MSC type level. And it's really just appraising things and giving strengths and weaknesses and so on. But I'll give you a heads up on that. I've only included them there just now if you wanted to answer a couple of them, uh, ask a few questions. Uh, then they should be there. We have a WebEx every week on a Monday at 6.30 if you want to join it, mainly for uh, our remote uh, students. But if you just want to say hello, if you're not doing anything on a Monday evening at 6.30, I'm sure that's not the case. But uh, uh, please, please go on there and I'll answer any questions that anybody has. But remember, we have the Slack uh, channel. Uh, please use that if you have any questions at any time just to ask them. Try to avoid email if, if you can, just for this one module, because it's really difficult to kind of cope and we want to catch every single uh, question. Okay, does anybody have any questions about where the content is and what we're doing and things like that? I appreciate it takes a few weeks for us to get up to speed, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get them. Okay, uh, so that's the, that's the core uh, uh, structure, uh, you have your lab every week. The lab is there for you to develop your practical skills. Like it or not, it's a practical uh, business. <laughs> you can have great theoretical knowledge. If you can't put it into practice, you're, you, could, you could struggle. Vice versa, if you do too much practice and you don't know the fundamentals, you're going to muck up somewhere. <laughs> and this is serious mucking up. If you muck up the crypto, you are causing uh, so many, many, many problems. On the one end, you're protecting citizen data. On the other end, you're, you're protecting the corporate intellectual property, the source code and, uh, and their customer data and, and so on. Very costly if you have a data breach uh, and it isn't uh, encrypted. Okay, so the lecture should be in there. I've recorded two lectures. One is a slides with me talking over, and the other one is this one. It's up to you which one that you want. Uh, 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 they should both be there. And then I've included the source code. Uh, as I said, we're using Python across the module, uh, uh, as that is probably the most useful uh, tool that we can find that it shows the principles that we're investigating. OpenSSL is the other one that we'll have a look today. Python, OpenSSL, those are the two uh, core tools that, uh, that, that we'll be using. Okay, so I've got lots of examples that you can have a look at. Uh, so on, on the associated site, uh, if you look at symmetric key, 
I've got a whole lot of examples in there that you can actually try out. So the source code should be there uh, for each of the examples. If you want to just investigate uh, one or two uh, methods, uh, then, then they should all be, be there. Okay, so that's our, our, our roadmap there. Uh, we have our symmetric key is our core way to protect uh, data. We have our key exchange to be able to generate the key between Bob and Alice. Uh, we have hashing methods to make sure we have integrity. Uh, we have digital certificates or public key encryption uh, to make sure that we can get trust between uh, Bob and Alice and so on. Okay, so we have Bob and Alice here and we need to make sure that uh, we have some sort of privacy between them. Identity is proven with uh, public key and we'll also find that we can uh, use public key or private key uh, to create that uh, integrity in there. Okay, so as I said, we use a standard algorithm that's been approved and well published. So the days of secrets are, are gone. You can't really keep anything by secret by obfuscating it. So Bob and Alice must come up with the same key on either side and to be able to encrypt it. And the biggest problem is that what happens if you lose that key, you're stuffed. <laughs> So if you lose that key and you can't re regenerate it, there was a tweet this week from someone said they'd lost all the bitcoins. I don't know if it was if it was real or not, but someday they corrupted their their bitcoin wallet and they couldn't recover their private uh, key. And it's true because it's elliptic curve. You can't recover a key uh, because you didn't even have the passphrase uh, to recover it. Okay, so if you lose that, then it's finished. <laughs> the data is likely to be gone. Unless you've used a very simple password, you could use uh, a brute force to be able to try lots of different keys <laughs> and eventually find them. You'll find most people can recover their Bitcoin wallet uh, because they've only used maybe about 20 passwords in the past and you just have to give that to Hashcat and it'll try different permutations of that. So it's not lost, you can probably recover it because you've been a bit silly as a human. The best way that you can ever do this is to print out 12 words and put it into a safe. Because uh, with the 12 words you can regenerate uh, any uh, encryption key. Uh, so make sure that you, if it's something uh, important like a database uh, encryption key, then it's backed up somewhere and probably even in a paper form. Okay, so that's our three different classifications of, of, uh, of encryption or ciphering. Well, there's three there and encoding. Uh, symmetric, we use the same key on either side. Those are, are some of the methods that, that we use. Uh, most of these are seen as insecure. So RC2, RC4, DES and so on are old crypto that are, are, have got flaws in them. Asymmetric, we generate a key pair, two keys. One key, say the private key encrypts and the other key, the public key decrypts. We can do it the other way around. The public key can encrypt and the private key can then decrypt. So it's a little mathematical trapdoor that we have. And then we have hashing. So it shouldn't be possible to go back the way. Okay, so that isn't possible mathematically. But as we'll see, we can create a brute force on that to try out lots of different uh, data elements and produce the same hash. Uh, and then at one time we had rainbow tables that were created for every single uh, uh, piece of data that was ever created. So then we added in what's called salt. And salt made sure that the hash value changed. So now what we do mainly is that we have a, we're, we attack against a dictionary attack. So the dictionary just goes through, 
common words and tries them with permutations. If that doesn't work, it goes from AAA to ZZZ and we'll do a, a brute force like, uh, like that. And then the final one is just encoding methods, uh, base64, hex, octal, unicode, uh, who, who knows. Base64 is the most common that we would use in this module. The other one is what's called a binary array. A binary array is like a normal array that you'd get in a program, but it has one byte in each. In its purest form, our crypto is a binary array. It's just a bunch of bytes in an array, and we can walk through them. So as I showed last week, the more bits that we have in our keys, then the more, the more keys that we can actually have. So I, I typically remember 10, 2 to the power of 10 is 1,024. I also remember uh, 20, which is a million. So 20 is, is a million. I kind of lose it after that. Uh, try to do sanity checks. If you're in the exam or something like that, just try and do a quick sanity check. 10 bits gives you a million. Uh, sorry, gives you a thousand. 20 bits a million and, and, and so on. Okay, we're up to about here on the internet uh, for, for cracking 72 bits is our level. If you switched every computer on in China and got them all to look at some keys, then probably within a days or months, then it'll, it, it, they will eventually, one of the computers will find uh, the, the key, <laughs> okay? That's your strength. And NSA organization like that will have massive arrays of, of GPUs and, and, and crackers uh, and have the electricity bill <laughs> Uh, to be able to pay the electricity bill for that. Okay, so the more bits that we have, uh, the, the, the better. So let's take an example. We'll take a 64-bit key, which I appreciate is quite a small key. And that gives us 18 million, 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 million different keys. So it looks great. Everything looks fine. So we'll see how long it's going to take us to crack at that. Okay, so 2 to the power of 64 uh, gives us that. And, uh, and let's say that we're going to, uh, we're go each crack is one nanosecond, a billionth of a second. So one nanosecond is represented by that, okay? That's the EXP button on your calculator. So it's two to the power of 64 times one times 10 to the minus nine. And that comes out if you do, uh, that at about nine billion uh, seconds, okay? 2.5 million years, okay? So, sorry, hours, 285 years, okay? So if your message that you're sending is everybody will be dead by the time someone cracks that, then it's, it's okay. <laughs> but maybe if you're at the NSA, maybe in 268 years, 65 years, then it really still matters that that's still encrypted or so. But it looks okay. So everything's really good. We're fine. Let's go for a 64-bit uh, key for that. But computers get better every single year. Okay? So next year, you'll have twice the processing speed. And the year after, it'll be twice again. And they improve. So let's start off by saying that it's going to take that amount of hours. After a few years, actually, we're down 17 years. What we thought was taking us uh, millions of hours, 100,000 days here, takes us one day uh, to, to crack. Okay, so although you think that everything is fine now, processing power improves. And with Moore's law, it's generally doubled, well, not quite doubled, doubled every 18 months or so. Uh, so you can't guarantee that it's going to stay the same. And when quantum computers come along, it takes a jump. And some people are talking and that Moore's law could be broken quite, quite soon and we might be looking at even faster uh, computers. Okay, so uh, computing power improves. But the other thing we have is that we now have 
If you have a, a, a computer, you have two processors in it. Each of those processors has maybe six cores uh, in it. You now have 12 cores. Each of those 12 cores could be running uh, their own little, if you can use a parallel system, each split it into a twelfth and each can look after a set of keys, all running independently and in parallel. So we can see we can multiply the problem by taking half the keys, splitting them, it's 16, 32, and we can create massive uh, arrays for that. So now, if we do the computation, uh, it's not only getting faster each year, but now, if we look at the number of processors that are involved, actually, within a year, what we thought was taking us hundreds of thousands of days, we do in one, one day. In fact, it's two hours that we thought was taking that amount. If we have a million processors, which is not too difficult to, 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 to do, it's going to cost you a few thousand uh, dollars, uh, perhaps, and a, and a lot of electricity, then you can see that what you thought was secure uh, isn't, isn't secure. So if you're very lucky, you might buy one of these or rent them. Uh, so who has a GeForce card? Yeah. In your, is it Xbox or in your PC? In the PC? 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 Yeah, you got one. And in the laptop? Wow, good. Nice and warm at the back there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it does consume a lot of power. Yeah, it gets hot, kind of. And that's why you need that big fan uh, uh, there. So this is running uh, uh, from there. It's running the CUDA core. So Hashcat supports CUDA, so it's compiled to CUDA. It automatically will paralyze. That's not the right word, I know. <laughs> it will make the, the, the processing in parallel through the CUDA. So it's, it compiles to a CUDA uh, a, a executable there. And you can see there are three and a, nearly 3,600 of these little processors, all capable of doing hash cracking, uh, of doing crypto cracking and so on. They are optimized to do maths. They just love to process to do exclusive hours and bitwise everything. They are, they are fast uh, devices. And I think you can, you can get ones that have got even more uh, now. Okay, so the, uh, with these guys, you can now uh, multiply your speed by about 4,000 uh, at, at, at least. I'll show you how you can benchmark your, your, your machine using the Hashcat uh, ne ne next week. And then we end up with this. So do anyone know what that is? <laughs> it's a Bitcoin mining factory. I think it's in China. Uh, these are massive uh, 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 racks, arrays of racks. Uh, I've been around some of the best uh, data centers in the world. I won't say where, which one I was in, but it was like you could go almost for miles and full of GPUs and <laughs> massive uh, computing uh, resources. The amount of energy you need is ginormous and the amount of cooling that you need is, is off the scale. Uh, so it's, it's all water-cooled water-cooled uh, systems that they would use. So you can see here, <laughs> these are just full of racks with, uh, with GPUs in it. And it's cost-effective enough. The, uh, if they win 10 times a day with Bitcoin uh, cracking, uh, I don't know what the reward does. It used to be 12 at 12.5. I think it's going to drop quite soon. They rewarded 12 and a half bitcoins whenever they find the right hash for the block. Every 10 minutes in bitcoin, uh, a new hash needs to be created and then, and then the, the miners work hard <laughs> to find it. And then this one GPU here finds it, I found it, 
and then everybody else agrees, oh, boo, and then they get, they get paid. There's enough money in there, so Bitcoin eventually runs out. Okay, you do know that. <laughs> no more Bitcoins. We de-incentivize the miners uh, by reducing the fee every so often. That's what Satoshi Nakamoto did with his algorithm. And it, it's kind of what? It's just, just enough money just now to still make money with your bedroom PC and your crypto miner. But once it drops again, then you'll see a lot of these miners and probably the, the share price of Intel, because uh, they make a lot of money on GPUs, will, will, will drop. Which means there'll be a lot of GPUs in the market <laughs> to, to do lots of funky things. But I think the, the Amazon cluster, uh, I'll give you a demo of that next week, is pretty much full up uh, with this kind of thing. It's not full up with graphics processing and so on. It's full up with people uh, uh, doing things that are related. <laughs> I won't see any more. Okay, so there's one. Actually, NVIDIA will actually tell you <laughs> how much money you'll make for your, your graphics card. Uh, this was from, from last year, so it's probably changed a, a great deal. So they reckon if you buy that card and you keep your PC on all the time and set it up as a crypto miner, uh, you'll, you'll get your money back in about a year. So probably that's just one time that you manage to win. Or you can be part of a cluster you could all be parts of a miner. So let's say we, all of our PCs were turned on and we said, we'll all get together and whoever wins will share it amongst uh, anybody. So that, that, that can still happen. <laughs> There's JavaScript that's been uh, uh, created. Uh, there was one example in Starbucks in South America. When you connected to the Starbucks, you, you had this script that ran that made you a Bitcoin miner. And thought it was a bug in the first version. <laughs> and your CPU went up to about 100%. So it's kind of obvious that, that, that something was going wrong. You just connect to Starbucks and whoosh, <laughs> your PC gets a bit, a bit hot, okay? So there you go, that's, that's how much it costs you a day, uh, about half a dollar, uh, and that's your kind of returns uh, there. Okay, so what, what's the different types of a symmetric key that we have? Well, we need to our data varies, it could be one byte, it could be a zeta byte. Do anybody know what's above zeta? I don't know, I'm asking anyway. Is it femto? <laughs> I don't know. It goes giga, tera, I've, I've lost it now, tera. Uh, what, what goes after tera? Zeta. What? Ter tera peta, peta. Yeah, yeah, please get used to this because you'll be talking about petabyte. Oh, my PC's only got one petabyte. Yeah, you do know in post-quantum, there's a paper that was published that a uh, RSA uh, private key will be one terabyte. It's crazy. There is a, I'll send the paper. <laughs> one terabyte, just one terabyte, just, just for a key <laughs> because of the post-quantum uh, problems. Okay, so what we basically do is that we take our data and we cement it up into blocks. We put our data into blocks and we package it up and then concatenate them all together and send it off. At the other end, the person takes, takes the data stream, cipher stream if you want to call it, chunks it back and decrypts each block uh, one at a time. Okay, so we take our cipher block, we take our secret key, uh, we cipher each of the each of the blocks. And a stream cipher, it's different. A stream cipher, it's really simple. It's just an XOR gate at the end. So we take our bits, ones and zeros, and then we take our secret key and we feed it into something like RC4 or Chata20 with a random seed, we'll call it a salt or an initialization vector and then it produces a pseudo-infinite key. I say pseudo-infinite is that if you need an infinite amount of bits, then you'll get it. If you need one bit, you'll get it. So whatever length your stream is, it will produce the key uh, for you. And then all it has to do, uh, I used to draw XOR gates like that. 
is to X or together. Uh, is this the right symbol? Is that the right symbol that you use? XR. Is that right? Is that very good? No. Uh, so we, we just XR. And that's the great thing about stream ciphers. It's a really simple uh, ciphering process and deciphering, which makes it much, much faster in them. Okay, so there's, here's RT4, which has been used for Wi-Fi in the past. It's got a kind of bad track record, <laughs> and it wasn't its fault. Uh, what happened? Does anybody know what happened with WEP and wireless? It was a kind of bad story. Uh, they used what's called a 24-bit initialization vector, the salt, which meant that it wrapped round. It came round again. And all you had to do was XOR the same IVs. And you would get the origin, you would get the text back uh, again. Which meant that uh, after a day, you could crack the whole of the, the Wi-Fi uh, network. You just had to force it through something to roll over and you would be able to crack. And in those days, it was a shared key <laughs> across the whole network, which meant everybody's Wi-Fi was, 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 was broken. Uh, so it wasn't really RC4's uh, fault for that. It was just badly designed uh, Wi-Fi. Now we use ES encryption uh, for it, uh, mainly. So we take our, our key and our salt. Uh, I'll say here, but we'll come back onto it, P... B, K, D, F, S, 2 is the basic method that we take our password and uh, convert it into an encryption key. And the reason we use that, not MD5, is because it's really, really slow. <laughs> it's the, one of the slowest hashing methods that we can, which doesn't mean to say that your uh, Wi-Fi is secure. Because if you've used a very small password you, and you have enough computation power, it's quite easy to crack your Wi-Fi password. So we do it in a Raspberry Pi and give a demo. Uh, uh, you capture the, the connection to the access point. If you can capture that, you see this generation of the key. And if you have enough com computational power, you can crack this PBKDFS too. It's a horrible acronym, I know. Uh, bcrypt is the other one. It's easier to say bcrypt than uh, pbkdfs2. So we create our key and our initialization vector, and it creates a, an infinitely long stream. We take our data stream, and we just XOR them together. So a 0, 0 gives us 0. A 0 and a 1 gives us 1. A 1 and a 1 gives us 0. zero. Well done. So the problem that we have now is that, let's say, the very last... Uh, block, we've only got 8 bytes in there, and we need to fill 16. So we need some way to identify that on the other side, that that's just rubbish. That's called padding. We need to pad out into our last block to make sure that it fills all of it, but on the other end, when we're decrypting it, we know that that's just uh, rubbish. The core methods that we can use are these, but I'm only going to, uh, we only typically use CMS uh, from there. Uh, it's defined in lots of standards, and it's the standard way that we would typically uh, pad that last uh, uh, byte. Because if, when you decrypt, you'll get rubbish at the end, and that's the last thing that you want with an email to be encrypted, to have rubbish at the end of your, of your signature. So CMS pads for the number of bytes that are left. Okay, so we count bytes, so a hex character is four. We count one, two, three, four, five. So how many is left? If we need 16, 11. We need 11, and in hex, 11 is B, okay? So we pad with B, 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 B to the, the very end. So in this way, we pad like that. So I'll show you an example here, hopefully, for our padding. If I can 
find one. Okay, so there's 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 hello. So you can see uh, I've padded there with uh, with zero Bs. If I now add one more character, what will the padding be, do you think? And then we'll go up again, keep going. We've got six there, and then we've got three. So we'll do that one. And now we've got one, okay? There's only a little lonely one at the end because we've got 15, 15 characters, 15 bytes in there. What's going to happen next if I have one more character? What do you think is going to happen? If I put in another character, go on, have a guess. It'll be no padding. It'll be no more padding. No more padding, that's right, yeah. So where, where does it go then? You're right, but keep going. <laughs> uh, the answer there was, sorry, the, uh, the answer there was uh, no more padding, which, was, which is correct, yeah. Sorry, I've got to repeat the question, so I'm not being rude. <laughs> I've got to repeat the question that you said. What do you think is going to happen? No more padding. What's going to happen? What? No more blocks. No more blocks. Just disappears. Bang! Okay, we create a new block. Okay, this time it's got, what's 10 in hex? It's a decimal. Eight. Okay, so we're adding on from there, okay, so we jump, we jump up from there and we create a new block, okay, so we fill the block and we pad and then when we filled up our block, uh, what's bad about this, what's, what's kind of bad, can you see a, a bit of a problem here? Take out. So if you inspect the, the code, you can take out this. Yeah, uh, oh, you can take that out. That, that's right. Well, you'll not see it because the next part is ciphering. So you'll not see the padding in the cipher. But I can tell how many characters roughly you've sent. Is that what you... That, yeah. So I can tell by the length of your cipher roughly how many characters you've got in there. If it's between 0 and 8 and 0 and 16, it's just one little block. If it's 32 and more, it's another block. So <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of downside of this. So there are other methods, but I'll, I'll not outline uh, those uh, uh, at, at all. OK, so some of the methods that, that we use uh, include uh, DES, uh, AES, 2FISH, RC2, Blowfish, and many different uh, uh, other, other versions. So you might come across these uh, along the way. Uh, uh, 3DES, AES, uh, Cha Cha 20 are, 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 the, are, the, are, the, are the main methods that, that we would see. Uh, and they, they all kind of went ahead to, to the NIST standard, NIST had a competition, and many of the methods, such as 2FISH, were advanced, but they lost against. So this was a Bruce, this is a Bruce Snyer uh, method, and he advanced that. He submitted it to the NIST AES standard, and it didn't win uh, at, at, at the time. Uh, so it's just that AES just happens to be the, the king of the hill just now. 3DES, RC2, and Reindal AES are the main methods. 128 bits, 256 bits, and everybody kind of forgets <laughs> the one in between. Nobody ever uses 192 bits, but it's there. It's there. It can be used. Uh, and uh, it's possible. Okay, so let's say we cipher and 
we cipher for Alice. All he has to do now is just copy and paste a few cipher messages together and they'll make sense. Or she could play back that message to, to Bob, to Alice. So we overcome this by adding uh, salt. And salt allows us to change the cipher uh, output. Only by knowing the data and the salt can you produce the, the cipher uh, together. So the most basic encryption method is what's called the electronic codebook. With the electronic codebook, we take our key and we encrypt our cipher block one at a time. Okay, uh, 128 bits for AES is our block size for DES, it's only 64 bits. So it will vary depending on the, the type. If we add salt, we add what's called an initialization vector uh, with the key, and then we add them together and it creates a cipher block. And then each block will be different because we're using a different salt value uh, for it. So one method we can use is what's called CBC or cipher block chaining. With this, we have our key and we take our initialization vector, our salt, and we XOR our data with the IV, creates an encrypted block. We then feed that block onto the next block and then do the same uh, thing to get uh, an encrypted uh, block. It means that we've got to have all of the data received before we can actually decrypt uh, the, the message. So here's an example, well-known example, uh, of using ECB. And look, we're using AES encryption, but why can I still see the penguin? So that's top quality encryption method, but I can still see the penguin. Why do you think that's the case? Well, the way the ciphering's done is that you can see there's uh, a JPEG is, is, is done in, in little pixel blocks and so on. So what's happening here is the same pixel block has the same data and will come out as the same cipher at the other end. So you can actually start to see <laughs> common patterns with inside the image. If we use CBC, then it's noise. Uh, the best encryption should look like noise, completely random. Every byte is as equally probable as any other uh, byte. So never ever use that one. <laughs> it's funny that the first version is ransomware, and it was great, it came out with ECB. So you can actually easily uh, crack them. Uh, many times we get asked, can you, can you find the key for, the, for, the, uh, ra for ransomware? Uh, no, <laughs> it's completely random. Do you know how people get around that? So there are, there are companies online that say, we'll, 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 we'll decrypt your ransomware. Do you know what they do often, sometimes? How do you think they do that? So the key's complete random. So the ransomware goes on your machine, like the TravelX uh, e example. <laughs> so you can't get the key because it's completely random. Okay, it's impossible to find it. They, they, they encrypt it with their, uh, with their public key, send it back to the back office and it's sitting there as a ransomware key. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Do you know how they managed to do it? They pay the ransom. <laughs> I have to go, oh God, I never thought of that one. <laughs> Here's me with my Hashcat and the Python program. And I say, yeah, yeah, we, we'll, we'll decrypt it for you. Just send the files. Hello? Is that, is that, is that, the, uh, is that the ransomware people? Yeah. Uh, $1,000, no problem. We're making 5000 on this anyway. So it's a 4K profit. <laughs> We're coming up. Uh, don't, I don't advise you to, to do that kind of thing. Morally and ethically, it's really bad. But there is one case of one company that is thought. The other way is that the, the cyber criminals have been busted and they've, they've managed to get their private key. And the private key can then decrypt any of the keys that are found. But basically, if you've got ransomware, you're kind of stuffed. 
uh, to, to, to get the data back because you're not going to get the AES key which I, I created it. Okay, so here's an example here. I'm taking lots of E's <laughs> uh, and I'm using a 64, 64 uh, bit block for the DES. So that's eight characters, okay? Eight ASCII characters will fit in one. For AES, it's 16. Try and get that into your head. 16 for AES, characters, eight bytes, eight for DES. Okay, so E, 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 E. And then I put it into ECB and look, every time my block comes out the same, <laughs> same, same, using that password there, we'll see the repeated pattern here, here, and here, and so on. Okay, so it shows why you really need to add salt to your cipher because you can actually see at the end. I mean, the last little bit has got the padding, so it looks a bit different, but all of the cipher blocks will actually look the same, and it's not too difficult to, to crack that. So let's look at AES. AES, <laughs> okay. So basically the method works by uh, one, one uh, pace right, uh, turn around uh, a, a 90 degrees, and that's it. So on the other end, you need to turn around 90 degrees that way and take one step that way, okay? So basically all you're doing is taking a path and then on the other end, you just reverse it back again. But the scrambling process is going to be really quite difficult <laughs> and for somebody to go through uh, that and discover uh, the, the process. It's difficult to see from here uh, what goes on, but we go through uh, 10 rounds for 128-bit uh, AES. We go right through 10 rounds of that scrambling using a different bit of the key uh, each time, okay? The first one is it goes through what's called an S box. Uh, AES uses a substitution box. It's a little scrambler. If I take a byte in, out the S box comes another byte. So if my input is four, three, then what comes out is one A. On the other end, over here, if I put 1A in, 1A in, I get magically 43. Can you see that? That's not lining up, is it? You get 43 out there. Didn't quite. Okay, so the S box is a scrambler, which is a bit of a problem because everybody knows the S box. Uh, here, uh, we've managed to crack 128-bit crypto in 30 seconds. And we do that by listening to the electrical power supply. <laughs> uh, and you see little glitches. Uh, because you know the S-Box, we can reverse that back. And in 30, 30 minutes, we can actually recover all of the key. Uh, I'll send you the video of it being done live by Dr. Owen Lowe here. Uh, we're also looking at the radio waves, <laughs> you do know that your mobile phone gives off radio waves that can be picked up. The signs of crypto are obvious <laughs> when it's actually uh, working. It's what's called a side channel. You might think that everything is great, <laughs> and this is great, but our systems leak information that can be uh, cracked. So there's an S box here. You then do a shift row. You take your little, you take a little matrix of four by four, and then you do a little row shift of that. The next one is a column shift. You do, remember your little matrices you get, you do shifting of the columns. Okay, so then it just goes through that 10 times, and the other end, it does the reverse, it does the column shifts in reverse, it does the row shifts, and then goes back through the S box, and it comes back. Okay, isn't that beautiful? Sorry. <laughs> so might, some people might think the Mona Lisa is beautiful. I, I kind of think. Well, I think public key is beautiful, but we'll, we'll do that a little bit later. But it's amazing how it works and, and how the uh, 
uh, manages to, to, get the, to get it to, to, to work, okay? So I've got a little demo uh, of uh, the explanation of that if you want to watch it. Uh, I've added that to the, to the content. Okay, how are we doing for time? Oh, my battery's going to fail in a minute. Uh, what, what we'll do is we'll have a break. Are we? Uh, we'll have a break for five minutes. I'll get the register uh, distributed. Does anyone have any questions on what we've done? Uh, we'll do our last little bit. Then we'll have our... We'll have Bob. I'm looking for you this week to... Do better in the second part. Okay? So we'll have a break for five minutes. I'll get the register and then we'll, we'll continue on and do our little bit there. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, so we'll, uh, we'll just finish this, uh, this, this section and uh, then we'll do a little test at the end. Okay, so AES is the king of the hill, uh, but uh, Cha Cha 20 is taking off uh, massively. Uh, when we look at SSL, we'll probably find when we look at our Warshark traces that Cha Cha 20 is used fairly extensively in creating our, 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 our tunnels. Another one that's used is what's called 3DES. And 3DES is really interesting, I think. Uh, so DES used to be an old standard, and it was 56 bits, and it was used a lot in the finance industry and so on. 56 bits, as we know, is insecure, because it could be brute forced quite, quite easily. So they had the problem, how are we going to upgrade DES when we have all these devices and crypto already? Uh, how are we going to upgrade it into... Uh, a, a safer key, but also support old crypto with, with DES and so on. So what they came up with was this. So you probably won't see what we're doing here and how it works, uh, but have a little look uh, back uh, to see uh, uh, the, the, the basic process. But basically what we do is that we take three rounds, we take our keys and we create two keys. K1 and K2, and we use K1 uh, again. Each key is 56 bits, so we end up with 112 bits equivalent key size. So we're, we're well away from that 72 bits, so everything looks fine. Uh, we first encrypt with the, with the first key, and then we decrypt with the second key. <laughs> we take the first key again, and then we encrypt. Uh, it looks a bit crazy for that. So does anybody know why we do that? It just seems, why don't we just do 128 bits in for one encrypt phase? Can anybody see what we could do here? I'm not expecting you to answer this, but does anybody, can anybody see what we could do here? If I replace key two for key one, Okay, if I just have K1 and I put K1 in, what happens to that process, do you think? It's just 56 bits. It's just a DES, okay? So the whole reason for this is that if I wanted DES, I could just feed in K1 equal to K2 and I get DES. It's going to take three times longer than it normally would, but at least I can buy a single chip. Or if I want three DES, I take two bits of the key and, and it will work like that. Well done, thank you. <laughs> Impressive. Uh, so the last method is a, is a stream cipher called ChaCha20, uh, uh, created by Google. Uh, Google are pretty good with their crypto. Uh, really uh, push forward. Cloudflare are another company. Uh, have a look at their blogs. Cloudflare are a really strong company in getting rid of bad stuff. Where the industry would quite happily go on forever and ever with horrible crypto. Uh, Google and Cloudflare, uh, NCC, uh, have a look at NCC. There's a lot of great people working in, in NCC uh, out of Manchester, uh, do great kind of crypto stuff. But Google uh, have created some standards and one of them is ChaCha20 and Poly1305. Poly1305 is an authentication type uh, method, and ChaCha20 is the core uh, symmetric key encryption uh, method. Okay, uh, so it was, uh, it's also been standardized. 
for TLS. And the great thing is, is that TLS 1.3 now supports these, this type of method and gets rid of a lot of the old uh, methods. So there's a site called SSL Labs that we'll go to and see if a, if a website has bad crypto on it and so on. Uh, but there's a lot of cases of really poor standards on, on, on websites. Okay, so I should have a little try there. We'll try it out. Press that button. Hopefully it's going to come up. Uh, so this is the Poly 1305 from there. So it was uh, created by, by uh, Daniel Bernstein, uh, who has done a lot of work in, in this, in this uh, area. So if you're interested, that's uh, got some Python code in there to make that work. Uh, but the Chata 20, I think is this link here. And so the Chata 20, there's no padding anymore. Okay, we don't have to pad. Uh, we'll, we'll take every, every bit uh, at, at a time. So this is the RC4 uh, example here. Okay, so it's been standardized and it's now integrated into uh, a lot of different, different methods. Okay, so the, the standard version is typically 128 or 256 bit with what's called a 32-bit nonce. The nonce value is the salt or the initialization vector. The salt must be stored along with the cipher. If you do not have the salt, you cannot decrypt uh, the message. And that's a problem because when you have your cipher, then the intruder can take the salt and then take your password and put both together and then they'll be able to decrypt uh, the, the message. So it's three times faster than, uh, than AES, and it's very good for IoT and, and lightweight uh, devices. Uh, so this is RC4. Uh, this is a little bit of Python code uh, in here that, uh, that implements the RC4 method. And you see it's quite simple. <laughs> okay, uh, it, it, It's not like that scrambling, horrible shifts and all that, rows and S boxes and, and things like that. It's a simpler type of uh, code that will implement our stream cipher. So this will fit much happier on your little sensor than having to implement that complex AES method with its big S boxes and, and, and so on. So this is the key derivation function for uh, for uh, at, uh, our RC, RC4. So this will create our infinitely long uh, key. But it's this one here. Does this look crazy to you? What crazy, what crazy programmer did that? <laughs> What's wrong? What do we call that? That's an infinite loop. <laughs> so on Python, there's a little trick called yield. Yield says stop and wait to be called back up again for some more data. So although this looks like an infinite loop that it goes around to generate the key, basically what will happen, the Python code will go back in and say, give me another 32 bits of the key and Alexor and stuff like that. So here we actually see the generation of the key calls up uh, this and then uh, that, and you see it returns from here. And then when we use it in the code, we just take our data stream and take the key that we generate here. And because of the yield, every time we've got more data, it will ask for that, okay? So that's the method that we use to make sure that we only have a key length equal to our, our data <laughs> there. So it might look crazy to have uh, that. And don't do that, by the way. It's not good. <laughs> that will hang up forever. While true is, is forever. But this yield 
uh, stops it uh, stops it from from it stops that little function, and every single time it can the program can demand more and more uh, data back uh, from it. Okay, and the last little thing that we're going to do is actually really important. Uh, so it might take a while for this to sink in, but this is really fundamentally important in what we actually do across the whole of the module. So you have what's called key entropy, <laughs> okay? We have two to the power of 128 keys. Amazing, fantastic. Uh, you've got to be a space alien <laughs> with massive quantum computers to be able to crack that, okay? So it looks fantastic, everything's great. It's not going to be crackable. <laughs> but then we go for QWERTY, one, two, three, and then we're actually reducing uh, the, the key space for that. So we create what's called a key derivation uh, function. So a key derivation function will be a standard method. Well, I'll explain it next week, but it could be SHA-256, or it could be bcrypt, or it could be some other method that we're using to take some data and then generating the same key uh, from, from them. So how do we measure what the equivalent key size is? If we say that 72 bits is our limit, we need to make sure that we have some headroom between 72 bits and what we've uh, implemented. So if we take the characters as a pin number and we work out how many characters are possible, okay? So if we've got 10 characters, 10 characters and I hope I've got this right for 10, one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, this is six. For six, six character pin number, we can have from zero to nine, we'll have six times six times six, sorry, 10 times 10 times 10, six times. So it's actually uh, 10 to the power of six gives us the total number of, uh, of six-digit uh, pin numbers that we can, we can have. Okay, then we take the log of that and divide it by the log of two, and we get what's called the key entropy. So 26 bits is like your pocket calculator or your iPhone or your iWatch could probably crack uh, that. So it's not a, that's not a good one. If we take lowercase a to z, then that's 26 to the power of 6, which gives us uh, that. That's the number of uh, different passwords that we can get with lowercase only a to z. And we look at that and go, that's not good, 37 bits. We now take upper and lowercase. Upper and lowercase, we now have 52 different characters. So it's 52 to the power of six will give us the total number and it's looking a bit better, but it's still rubbish, <laughs> 45 bits. Now we take numeric, 62 different characters roughly uh, in there, 26, 26 and 10, 50, 62. That's the number of total brute force uh, things that are possible. You can have tilde A hash 946. <laughs> That's still rubbish. It's 47 bits. It's not good. One second on a GPU will crack. I mean, uh, a microsecond, sorry. A microsecond will crack every single six character. I'll show you in a little minute. And now if we go for lots of different characters, these other ones in there, go there, and it's still, it's still uh, pretty bad. So we'll just try this out and I'll show you for our entropy in there. Okay, so let's go for a hash cracker of a billion, 100 billion per second. And I'll just go for maybe 256. In fact, we'll just go for one processing element. If I go for uh, A to Z, A to Z, uh, every single nine-character password 
is cracked in 54 seconds. Everyone, every single one of them. Even 10 is cracked in 23 uh, uh, minutes. Okay, that's not a fast uh, cracker uh, there. If I went to a one, uh, say a one tera, two minutes for every 10 character lowercase in there. If I now add upper and lowercase, well, it's taken a bit longer. We're up at a day and a half. We'll crack every single upper lowercase. <laughs> so now you're forced to put in uh, a number. Okay, well, there we go for uh, eight digits in this case for upper lowercase and, and numbers. Every single password is cracked within four hours. Everyone, <laughs> every single one in there. So you now ask for all these other characters. Well, we see here for nine digit passwords, if you use tilde slash a, lowercase a, whatever you want, it, they, are, they are cracked in 18, less than a day. Even all of the, your 10 digit passwords are cracked within 60 days. I mean, you might just get it straight away. So this is pure brute force and not a dictionary uh, type uh, attack. Okay, so that's a scary thing to end on, but I'll explain a bit more and I'll show you uh, Hashcat next week. So Hashcat will generally go from a dictionary type uh, attack to a brute force. So this is a brute force at one tera hash, uh, one tera cracks per second, only with one processing element. So we're not even distributing it across uh, different GPUs, say. Uh, if we use upper lowercase numbers and characters, 12 digit passwords are at risk. <laughs> and once they're processed, that's it, they're processed. And the salt values are kept beside the, the hashed value and also the cipher. So the intruder just picks off the, uh, the, the salt and then just goes through the brute force trying each one and then eventually you don't get an exception and, and that's the, the password uh, cracked. Okay, so I'll explain a bit more next week and we'll do more in the lab to try and understand that. So make sure that when you're generating your passwords then you understand the, uh, the key entropy. Okay, so let's, let's uh, get our little test out. Okay, so if you could uh, connect into menti.com. As menti.com and uh, that, that key. Everybody signed the register? Yeah, good. Okay, we all getting connected in some way. Good, okay, we're getting there. Right then, okay, you get most points if you get it right. <laughs> you get no points if you get it wrong. <coughs> Fastest finger wins with the right answer, okay? Right, is everybody, everybody connected? I think it still shows the, the code and there. Uh, okay, get yourself uh, Bob, you taking your Bob this week again? My money's on Bob this week, okay? I have faith in Bob. And Dallas. Okay, right, we're all, we're all connected. That's not a good start, is it? All oh, right, so sorry, I need to start the quiz. That's what I need to do. Okay, what was AES originally known as? Was it known as 
Tickle fish, two fish, super fish, blue fish, rain dal or rain mate. It's <laughs> good. It's not tickle fish. <laughs> it's not two fish. Two fish is a method. Uh, blue fish. No, no, no. Rain dal, rain dal, rain dal. I'll say it every week, okay? Rain dal. It was known as rain dal after its Belgium uh, inventors. It's definitely not tickle fish. And well done, nobody took uh, rain mate, that's good. Okay, so let's see how we got on there. Looks like Snowy Fox, no Bob, you know Bob, Bob this week, are you not there? Where are you? Okay, that's fine, so BB84 was, was top there. Okay, next one, uh, fastest with the correct answer. Who created ChaCha20 Poly 1305? Microsoft, Intel, Cloudflare, Google, Facebook, or RSA? <coughs> RSA were taken over by Symantec, I think. I bet they're for sale again, if you want to buy them. They created RSA. They had a backdoor problem. Anybody know about that backdoor problem? Uh, the NSA allegedly put in a, a backdoor in the elliptic curve random number method and kind of got money and all that kind of thing and it was discovered and didn't end up well. Good, okay, well we've got 20 people got that one right, well done. Uh, <coughs> not Microsoft or Intel. There, so let's see how we got on. And Vroom did well there, a lot of People got that one right. Where's Bob? Are you not? Yeah, yeah. You'll appear soon. Okay, BB84 is still still top for that for that one. Okay. Uh, which is a stream cipher? Stream. Okay. Stream cipher. AES, DES, 3DES, Blowfish, or RC4. Stream cipher rather than a block cipher. Oh, quite a difference here, okay? At uh, block, 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 stream. <laughs> okay. RC4, and I showed you it, I showed you it, so you can't see it, and we'll, we'll rewind back the video, okay? <laughs> and we will show that, and you've got the evidence, yeah. We will show that I did say it was a, it was a thing. So 11 people were listening, and uh, somebody's got a blowfish problem here. Seem to keep saying blowfish for every answer. It's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll do that again. Block, 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 stream. Okay. Stream, block, 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 block. Block, block, block. Okay. <laughs> I can't say enough. Okay. Those five people, no. <laughs> okay, you get zero marks. I don't often give zero marks for an, an exam, but if you say that AES is a stream cipher, it's zero, okay? <laughs> but we're just learning, okay? So don't worry. Uh, okay, so BB84 is still up there. Who's BB84? BB, well done, right at the back, yeah. Okay, and L is in there, crocodile. Who's a crocodile? Yeah, well done. And Snowy Fox, oh Bob, yeah, yeah. <laughs> come on, come on, Bob, come on, Bob. <laughs> I'll show you the next answer, okay? Answer is C for the next one, okay? <laughs> come on, Bob. Uh, Jamie, the Snowy Fox. Oh, I think uh, fast, you were the fastest there, BB84, well done. That's excellent. Okay, come on, Bob. Okay, uh, Block Cypher has a 20. 128 bit block size, how many bytes will it process at a time? 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. 128 bits. How many bytes can you get into that? Sixteen. Six, 128 divided by 16 is 16 bytes. If you remember back when I showed that cipher, 16 and there. Uh, Okay, uh, no, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> many times, okay, that's a bit, that's a bite, that's a word, that's a bit, that's a bite, that's a word, okay, that's a bit, bite, word, okay, 
bit and a bite isn't the same thing. <laughs> uh, good. Well, that's good. And those people just went for the one in the middle, didn't they? So that's, that's fine. At least nobody said four, which is good. Okay, so how are we getting on here? Cat56 did well there. Oh, Cat56, uh, BB84 didn't do so well. And Bob is doing well, yes. Bob, go on, Bob. Go on, Bob. You've got a uh, Snowy Fox. Uh, who's Snowy Fox? Good. It's all the people at the back. I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, so, so that's fine. And Cat56, who's Cat56? Yeah, you're good. Good, you're doing well. Uh, SD, Kateri, Helen H, and so on. Good. Uh, these are not representative of any things you would get in the test. Okay, so not worry. <laughs> How many rounds does 128-bit AES have? I did, I did outline it. I maybe didn't highlight it a, a great deal, uh, but I did say it. Uh, sometimes you want to keep notes, like from the lectures, if you want. Ha-ha! Ha-ha, <laughs> good. Okay, if you get this in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, give me a call, okay? <laughs> Hi, is that, uh, is that Bill? Yeah. How many rounds does he use? Yes. <laughs> it has 10. Okay, 10, 10, 10. Okay, 10. I'll say it again. 10. 10, 12, 14 takes you through the basic phases. 10, not 16. I know that was the answer to. Not 14. Oh, then 32. No, nah, we, have, we have six people, really. <laughs> I'm doing well here, I don't think. Okay, come on, Bob. Oh, Bob, what have you done here, Bob? <laughs> Did you get that one wrong, Bob? No, you got it right. Oh, oh, there, yeah. you've slipped a little bit. So, Snowy Fox by quite a long way. Frosty was the top. Who's Frosty? Yeah, well done. Uh, the j j j j bundant. What's that? Is that your password? Is that your password? No. <laughs> Jaw, was it? Well, who said that? Yeah. Oh, I see. What is it? Jolland. Jolland. It's your, it's your name. Yeah. It's your name. You don't, you don't spell it like that, though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't put numbers in names normally. I might be wrong, but uh, it uh, looks like a hash. Is that your hash name or something like that? Let's not go there. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've got a 12-bit encryption key. How many keys are possible? Oh, I know that's a difficult one. That's horrible. Horrible, horrible question to ask. But just in case, you might just quickly do a little calculation in your head. You've still got five seconds to do the... If you get this, you're doing really well. <laughs> you went for the middle one, didn't you? I knew that. That's why I put that one at the start. <laughs> okay, we've got a normal distribution there. <laughs> Uh, but the answer is, f yeah, yeah, 10 bits is 1,000, 11 bits, 2,000, 12 bits is 4,000. That's how I would do it. Please don't ever let anybody tell you how to do anything like this. Have your own way of doing it and stick with it, because there isn't really a defined method. So the four people, did Bob get that one right? He did. You sure? We'll find out. <laughs> Are you definitely sure that you got that one right? Yeah, wow, that's amazing. So who was the other three? Who was the other three? One, two, two. Yeah, well done. And three at the back, okay. And there was another hand there, but we won't go there. <laughs> okay, it looks like we've got our four there. We've got that one right. Who is it? Come on, Bob. Come on, Bob. Come on, Bob. Let's see this one. Oh, you, oh yeah, come on, Bob. Come on, Bob. And Jamie and then and Snowy Fox. Ho, ho. This is, you're doing it different from last week. Last week you started really fast. Okay, so Bob's, Bob's on, the, on the move, okay? So just watch Jamie. Who's Jamie? Ah, oh, we're changing all the time. This is really good. <laughs> Nobody's taking the lead. But uh, Snowy Fox is still my, uh, I think, we'll be, who's Snowy Fox? Good, okay. I, my money's on Snowy Fox. If I had any money, it's not. It's not. Okay, it's not on. Okay, we'll, we'll go for Jamie then. 
Okay, these are not representative of any exam questions, so don't worry. I say that again and again. For a, if we use a key derivation function for passwords, if we go from AA to ZZ, how many keys, how many encryption keys are possible? I don't recommend you do this, by the way. Uh, but if you just went from AA to ZZ through a brute force, how many uh, encryption keys would be possible? You've got a second to devote. Please do it quickly. And the answer is 676. Well done. Uh, nine people got that one. Uh, right, uh, you need to go back to your thinking <laughs> there. <laughs> but uh, have, have a think about that one. Uh, 52. I see where you're coming from. I see where you're coming from. Uh, that's fine. Uh, this one, no idea where you're coming from. No idea. <laughs> Just, you, you live in a different planet from me. This one, yeah, I know, you just went for the middle one there, but that was, that was fine. But uh, did you get that one right, Bob? Oh, no. What would you pick? Middle one. Oh, no. And the middle one, right. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you were the one that picked that one? No, no. This, this middle one, that's not the middle. <laughs> that's the end one. We call that the end one. These are the middle ones here. So you would have done well if you went for the middle one. All right, we'll see. I think this might be the last question. So there we go. And Cat3, Jamie did well there. Frosty, BB84 did very well. And it's Jamie. Well done. Who's Jamie? <laughs> that was excellent. It's always good when a strawberry wins. Uh, nobody dislikes a strawberry. That's that's. No, I, you did hear me. I was over here. Okay, I was over here. These are not representative of questions in the exam. They'll be more descriptive type things. Or do you want them? Do you want these? Do you want the exam to be done through Mentimeter? That <laughs> I, sh I, sh I show them. Oh, no coding. No no coding. Pro uh, I'll say this. Coding is your practical skills and to be able to see things. Uh, this is an MSc level, so it's more descriptive. Have a look at the GitHub, and I've got sample questions uh, that we'll go over. So they're more, mainly descriptive. So I might ask something related to how many passwords might be possible if uh, the difference between upper and lower case uh, uh, characters for, for cracking uh, the hash. But I'll explain more of what the questions will look like. Okay, mainly descriptive, and you, you use a get a mark if you can at least explain a few uh, uh, basic things. Any other questions at all from that? No? Good, okay, well thanks very much. I'll see you in the lab in about 10, 15 uh, minutes. Oh, it's going again, thank you.